luckily for me, the thing is that I had ported over or brought along a lot of my relationships from my college days and all of that over a period of time. So a lot of those guys, what they really wanted to see was that I had started off. You understand? Because mentally, they just did not want to be the first person in the first ever deal. This is the real estate investing experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes. And that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else with your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Experience. I'm your host, Chris Grenzig. With me, as always, is John Cohen. How you doing? I'm doing. We got it. <laughs> that's that's I'm about doing. apt for the mood in the office. Yeah, it's it was a tough week. We had uh, emotional roller coasters up and down. We had sellers wanting to bail, lenders not helping us, equity not speaking our language, <laughs> documents written in different you know, different languages and translations and not, it was, uh, it was fun, but we are ending the Friday feeling really good about next week. We are. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> no reason not to. You got nothing to lose, right? The weekend's fine. Hey, well, you know, Monday morning, you know, we'll see, but, yeah, but we will see. We are going into, we are going into Saturday feeling good. <laughs> there we go. Um, all right. Well, we'll figure Love it out. Love that positivity, point, guys. Keep it up. Um, awesome. We have, uh, we've been a little bit late, so we'll get right into it. Um, got a great guest on, uh, a guy I've been talking to for several months now in a little mastermind we've done. So no good deal about him, but I think there's a lot of stuff we'll dig into. I think he has some really good insights. Um, so not going to hype you up too much, but with that being said, oh, oh no, 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 please go ahead. I can wait. <laughs> we can wait a couple ahead. minutes. <laughs> I, I can wait. Just, 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 uh, just, you know, flatter me. No, uh, it's all good. Head's big enough. Um, but yeah, yeah you want to, Omar, thanks for coming on, bud. Appreciate it. No, thank you. So look, my background's in finance, like a lot of guys graduated from a good college, like most Asian kids, I was always studying, 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 and partying, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> and basically, I was lucky enough to be that uh, essentially, I graduated in 2008, but, uh, you know, had a lot of good connections through frat brothers, this and that. And if you go to some of the right schools, you know, eventually, invariably, you know, somebody, right? So that's how I kind of got my start, did a lot of portfolio management, oil and gas deals, structured a lot of deals in investment banking, M&A stuff, all that kind of jazz. And then when I moved down to the US a few years ago, I was trying to think, okay, like, what do we do? What's the next thing? And what I really didn't want to do was be sucked up into this vortex, like a lot of my colleagues, you know, everybody's like a director of investment banking or executive or MD. And the one thing I was realizing with a lot of these guys was, and even some of the guys who were older, who were my bosses was, that they'd be making, look, they were making good money, don't get me wrong, but none of them were making what you call fuck you money, right? Where you make it for two years and then you kind of walk away sort of deal, yeah. right? None of them were making that. And they're working long hours, which is totally fine, but it's at the cost of everything else. You know, they're, they, they don't, I mean, look, they, they're maybe most of them are divorced by the time they're 40, Right. They all drink a lot because, I mean, how else are you going to paper over the void in your life, right? And that sort of stuff. And it got me thinking because my family is very entrepreneurial. So the one thing that I'm really grateful to my parents was the fact that they were always there for the right, you know, and mm -hmm. all the right big events. And, and I was like, man, I grew up, I was very grateful that I grew up in a, in a decent household, you know, well, all, we, we didn't really want for anything. And I needed to figure out what to do, right? So luckily for me at that time, I had a really close friend, family friend of ours. They are a very big uh, industrial family in Toronto and they were reorganizing their office portfolio in Houston because back in the 90s when this guy's dad had come down to some person trade show to Houston and he apparently got roped into buying like over a period of years 60 70 million dollars of office properties in Houston and now as you know as they're older the new generation wants to get their money you know that sort of estate planning thing he's like hey you're in Texas or Dallas why don't you know you swing down I'll meet you there and let's kind of figure it out so I kind of helped them restructure their portfolio mm -hmm. like you know Everybody kind of gets what they want. So nobody's at, you know, at each other's short trying to kill themselves. Right. And that's kind of how I got my start in the US. And what I think what helped me was I had a background on the finance side, just, just background myself. My family's fairly financially sophisticated. And we owned a lot of commercial real estate as a family, just as part of our portfolio. It okay. wasn't our business. So a lot of those things really helped me out. And then, you know, you do one deal and you do two deals and then you meet the right people. And the one thing I always tell people, Two mistakes I made. I didn't move to the U.S. earlier in my life, which mm -hmm. is like the biggest mistake of my life. And I didn't move to Texas fast enough. And the other deal is that what I really liked about Texas, because I've lived in a few places, and I'm sure it's around the U.S. as well, is 
that people are very entrepreneurial. People want to get shit done. And that's not really the case in a lot of countries or pretty much any country that I've been to or lived in, right? And I've lived in three or four of them. So what I really liked was that when you do a good deal and when you meet the right people, people in the US specifically, they open a lot of doors for you. It's like, hey man, you might want to talk to this guy. You want to talk to the people are actually very helpful. Mm -hmm. But obviously you got to bring your A game, right? You can't be a dude, right? So that really propelled my business. And I think I carried over a lot of my contacts from my institutional days. Mm -hmm. So that kind of helped. And now, you know, the more deals you do, it's the same thing with you guys, right? I mean, you guys are a little bigger, but you know, you do more deals and more deals beget more deals. They beget more investors and one thing leads to another. Yeah, 100%. Um, Just a couple clarifying things. You were from Canada and then moved to the US. Oh, I'm from Pakistan. I moved to Canada for college. Oh, okay. And yeah, I moved to Canada for college. But what happened is that the college that I went to, University of Toronto, within that, there's a couple of, like all colleges, there are fracs, there are certain colleges. And luckily for me, what happened is that the fracs that I was in, frat that I was in, and the college, the specific college within the university that I was in, that was very heavily focused towards finance. Okay. Right? It, it just... It's not not because of me. This is sheer dumb luck. So that's how I got a lot of my breaks along the way, right? Gotcha. Obviously, okay. parting in this case really paid off. <laughs> done. That's that's a, I, I, done. I joke around because I'm not a I'm not a school guy, right? I, I played baseball and and luckily I was decent enough at that that school is whatever. Um, yeah. The two things I regret: one, I regret even going to college, and I wish I would have started what I was doing right out of high school. But then the other regret was not going to a real school, forgetting baseball and networking, you know, drinking with a fraternity would have been more beneficial to me today than, you know, drinking with my baseball friends, right? That didn't work out too well <laughs> because, you know. Well, it depends who your baseball friends are. Could, could, yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. you no know A-Rod, I mean, it, that's a pretty different volume. And you know what? Funny story. I had a kid on my team. His name was Alex Rodriguez. So I do know <laughs> A Rod, just A-Rod. not not you know the A Rod and A Rod. I know an A Rod. There you go. <laughs> but uh, no, so it it's true. It I, you know I say that you know if you go to the right colleges and you network the right way and you're in a fraternity, drinking with friends can open up so many doors in the future. And I think that's a part of college that high school should talk about more and not necessarily about oh this is a really good business school. That's fine, but you know, what are the inner workings there and who are the people you're going to be associating with and where do they come from? Mm-hmm. Because yeah, that's, and look, that's I think that's the big difference to be very honest with you. I mean, I know a lot of people tend to hate on college and I tell people, yeah, no, nope, you hate on Harvard because you didn't get into Harvard. <laughs> Nobody who went to Harvard hates on Harvard, right? <laughs> and you don't go to Harvard because, oh my God, they've got the one textbook nobody else in the world has. Ah, yeah. hell, hell no. Because you go there and the type of people you need, the exposure you get to certain things at an earlier age, the just the type of people you need. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest with you. The types, kinds, and exposure of things you get to do at a, such an early age where you can make mistakes, right? So you can make social faux pas and not get penalized, right? Yeah, no, it, 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 yeah. you, you get exposed to that stuff earlier because there's nothing wrong with, you know, going the other approach and working a little bit harder, but where the kid that gets out of those schools has the exposure at 22, you may get at 32 or you may get yeah. at 29. Yeah. That's the stuff they don't... T- I, I'm a, I'm a college basher. I'm an education basher from a standpoint of no man. But in the U.S., I'm going to be honest with you. You guys, it's indentured servitude in the U.S. You go to the <laughs> college and you it's it's servitude. I mean, this is crazy, man. Because I keep hearing people who are like hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt. I'm like, dude, screw that. That's I was gonna, what are you got to do. Like, come it's on. you you bury yourself before yeah. you start. And good, bad, or indifferent. I'm not saying that education is bad because I do read a ton of books or listen to a ton of books. I don't really read, but I do think educating yourself when you find the thing you're passionate about yeah. is super important. Mm-hmm. But when when you're thrown into, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, and like eighth grade is a repeat of fourth grade and 12th grade is a repeat of eighth grade. And then your freshman year, you know, I had to take gym. What the fuck are you taking gym in college for? That's I played. I was you on had, the baseball what, team. You have gym class in college. That you had a gym class in college. You have to take. I had to take really? Greek. You know Greek mythology in college. I fucking hate that shit. Did you and, go to like Rikers? Like, <laughs> you take like gym it, class in college. It, but that's the stuff that they make. That's like the you know the Ooh. the the what you do. It's like in your first two years of college. It's irrelevant. It's like you're. Oh yeah. Totally. You, you, they're like reteaching you everything. So then you pick a major. If you don't know what your major is, or you, or you, I want to do business now. It's like, okay, well, you now I'm 22. If I would have learned all that stuff when I was 16 and 18, maybe I'm making better decisions. Mm-hmm. Maybe you don't know. Oh no, I totally Definitely feel not. you. Like, <laughs> you. 
No, I feel you, man, especially in the U.S., I don't think with the way college education, how much it costs, at least, yeah. to do colleges. You have no room to make a mistake. Like, look, in Canada, I know everybody bitches about it, right? But at least our colleges aren't that expensive enough that if you make the wrong turn once or twice, you're not a slave for like the next 40 years of your life. So that's what I was going to say. I don't think necessarily, do I think college can be done better? Of course, right? Anything can be done better. I think now it's just gotten to a stage where the cost associated with it yeah. is starting to outweigh the benefits for significantly more people, right? The person that's always going to be, you know, for Mark Zuckerberg, who invents Facebook, college was irrelevant regardless of price, Correct. right? But, you know, 20, 30 years ago, college was relevant for yeah, 80, just to get 90% of people because it cost, you know, what, 10, 15, 20 grand in a private school, 15 grand a year. I don't even know. Now it's Dude, 40, five 50, grand 60, for university. Thousand. Five grand for the University of California, Berkeley in 91. I was reading some stat or like, it was like, no, no, $1,500 a semester. Scott Galloway is like a professor of marketing uh -huh. at NYU. And he was saying when he went to University of California, his semester fee was $1,500. Right. So yeah, now, now that, what, in the what's 90s that school for, now? 75, oh, it's like 30 000? grand, yeah, 30, 75 yeah, grand. So that, you know, that's, that's my point. It's, it's far outpaced the inflation of what, you know, you're getting for wages or benefits. So it's like, okay, now it's. It's still hugely beneficial for a ton of people, right? Doctors, lawyers, <laughs> people for finance. Not as much today as it used to be. No, of course, but it's <laughs> well, still- Well, but I would still... definitely want my doctor to have gone to college. I can assure you that. Oh, no, no, no. You have to go problem. to college for it, but they're not <laughs> yeah. making as much as they used to. Oh, in, yeah. in, no, you know, no, of course. There's all of the oh, reasons I can for tell that. You, my wife is a doctor. I can tell you. She's not, make, she's not making the same kind of coin that doctors 20 years ago. Exactly. But all I'm saying is it's yeah, still beneficial up. despite the cost. Of course. But it's less and less so for a lot of other, you know, if you're a art major, if you're a literary Literature major. If you're a, you know, honestly, I don't even understand. Major, if you're, like, if you're, it's not worth it anymore. No. If you're an English lit major, I honestly do not even understand why. So you all, all my dad said that. when I was going to school, I was like, ah, I'm playing baseball. I'm playing. He's like, just don't go to school for liberal arts, please. <laughs> like, <laughs> he said, just don't do that. And I was, I, I had no, yeah, I. I'm not an liberal arts type of guy, yeah. but I, I went to school for. Yeah, I graduated entrepreneurial. Uh, uh, economics background, but I went to school for business school, but that's not the, whatever. But my dad's like, just do not declare liberal arts because yeah. that, that that's literally four years in the garbage. Yeah. I will say the other part that I think a lot of people now are taking for granted is the amount it makes you grow up during that time period, especially yes. if you're on your own. That's the part people don't take into account. So like the thing about yep. who I was at 18, 17, whatever, yeah. I, I was 18 and who I was at 22 coming out of it. Yeah. And- I think I don't think I would have been nearly as far along as if I went to like a community college yep. and I lived at home. Now, can you get that without going to school? Hundred percent. You go live in your own. Well, yeah, but you get you the education the part, right? You get the education part. You don't get the socializing part and the fit, like emotionally and mentally growing up and handling yourself in For situations. Sure. Yes, part. Th that's yeah, the yeah. part that goes unsaid. Like I said, I think the two things that people don't talk about enough when it comes to education is you grow up when you live alone. Mm -hmm. And the doors that you could potentially open with the people you surround yourself with. That is, yeah, I'd pay 200 grand for that today. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. definitely pay 200 oh, grand for yeah. that for college, but not where I went. I just, I, I made the wrong decisions from, I played baseball at Queens College. Queens College is a good school, but I lived at home, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it was not what I should have done. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, think about it. Charles is how old and he just went to yeah, NYU for, for his master's. You know, his he went to NYU, the real estate school to get his master's in development. And he said flat out, he's like, it cost me a hundred grand. He said, I don't know that I'll learn much, but I'm sitting down with, you know, endowment fund sons yeah. and, you know, yeah. massive, you know, net worth guys that, yep. you know, I think it'll pay for itself in the next five to 10 oh, years. No, and, and guys, a lot of people don't realize brand name matters so much. Like, trust me, you can be a complete dummy from Harvard. And at least at the first conversation point, somebody drops, invariably the guy who went to Harvard will tell you he's from Harvard. <laughs> but, but even if somebody else says, you know, he's from Harvard, you can be a complete dumbass after that. And at least for the first five seconds, people, five minutes, people assume you're smart. Yeah, no, that's sure. all you need. Yeah. That's literally so, all you need. All actually, you need is open. I actually have a question for you. You have your CFA, right? Yeah. You have no idea how many doors it has opened. So I was going to I was going to ask that and then I was also going to ask has any knowledge you've gained from the CFA helped you in the real estate world at all? Okay, look, 
uh, to a certain degree, but not directly. Right. But I think for me, what the CFA really taught me was, and I tell this to everybody, look, directly, it has not helped me at all because I was potentially going to be an entrepreneur. So I wasn't going to go down that whole route. So it hasn't. But what's helped me, number one, was to realize just to shut the fuck up, go work and study. So work for 80, 100 hours a week, then study 20, 30 hours a week consistently for six to seven months on end after that. Mm -hmm. And don't bitch and moan and consistently just work towards the target. That's it. Like nobody gives a shit because all it does is it says pass or fail. It doesn't say how much you pass by. It doesn't say how much you fail by. It doesn't tell you that. It's very binary. So what that binary forces you to do is to realize that a lot of times outcomes do matter mm -hmm. and outcomes are a result of processes. And if you don't put the right processes in place, then you know, you got nobody else to blame but yourself because the exam is all about you. And in fact, they, I know this for a fact because I know this. I have had many people who were infinitely smarter than I was. In fact, infinitely smarter than pretty much everybody I knew. And the reason why they totally screwed up on the exams was because they couldn't manage themselves doing the exam, staying within time and just letting go of things. So as an example, the whole deal with that exam, and by the way, any big standardized exam, it's not the same thing, is look, if you get stuck on something, just move on. Just yeah. move on. Don't waste your time. Cut your losses. Move on. Because you're going to spend like four extra time here, whereas you could do go for three easy layups on the next three questions, yep. get more points, and all you lost is this one point, right? Mm -hmm. People don't really get it. People get emotionally attached to like that one question or one thing or one outcome, and they can't cut their losses. And that's the thing it really taught me under crunch time. You, got, you have to know when to cut your losses. 100%. It's just yeah. consistently work towards something. So because things aren't going to go your way. I mean, it's just the way it is. Yeah, for sure. So you're saying that the CFA, that it aspect really, of it has helped yeah. you, but not necessarily oh. like, you know, how to do this, you know, formula or whatever is helping. No, you. no, no, man. And to be honest with you, like the other part, I never really understood about all these exams, all these classes there, where you have to remember a formula. Yeah. And in real life, to be honest, I was like, dude, have you heard of Google? Yeah. Like, that's that's oh, another dude. complaint of mine. It's just that yes. they make you, you know, Oh, you can't look. You can't, you know, realistic. You want a real test? Give me a cell phone and tell me what I have to figure out. That's a real test. Yeah. Because yeah, that, that's life experience. It's like, okay, what do you want? What do you want? Here's your phone. Here's your phone. Who's smarter? Because mm -hmm. it gives you all the information. Now, yeah, maybe it's better if you didn't have this and you could figure it out on your own, but that's not real life. Real life, yeah. you're sitting in front of your computer. You don't know an answer. You go to Google. You go to something and well, you no, type it's not it just in. Real, you, you'll be very surprised. It's not just real life. Even when I was working at the bank, I wasn't the only one, obviously. Anytime, for instance, I have to write like a formula and a model, right? And I know how to write it, but you know, you don't, right? Because you have to kind of visualize it and think it out, right? I would literally go to Google and look it up. And I wasn't the only guy. Everybody. You know what's even funnier? My wife is a physician. 99% of her, for instance, colleagues look like a lot of things up, like simple things, they look it up. Of on course, a, it's on, just online on a reference. How are you supposed to remember? You can't. You can't remember everything. That, that's like you said, like talk, like talk about like doctor and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Obviously, if I have my surgeon, I want him to make sure he knows what he's doing. But I also want him. No, to but be even a, a surgeon is referring to stuff because that, that's, that's, it's I, impossible to expect a surgeon to know everything. That, that, right before he does whatever he's supposed to do on me, yeah. I'm hoping. I'm. I hope to God. Let me refresh this. Let me double check. Let me yeah. refer. Let me. Let me just go back through the notes. Right. I don't want to be like, oh, I read this book. You know, 1996. Now I'm going to cut your leg, you know, I'm going to, you know, do a surgery on your foot. It's like, wait a second. Like, you know, things have changed. Like you got to stay up with the times. And just because your book said something and you passed the test, I mean, realistically, can you, can you figure it out? Mm -hmm. Figure problem solving is the problem. That's, that's what you got to yeah. be able to figure oh, out. I agree with you hundred percent. And the other thing is most of the things that actually require you to think those things are changing at such a fast pace that by the time you wrote a book and by the time you're reading it. Yep. At least 20 to 30, 40 percent of the things have changed in the yep. Because you've got a new tool that cuts through like 50 percent of the stuff. I'll give you an example. Like my dad was joking once when I was studying for the CFA, he came to visit me because you know you have your financial calculator and everything. And he went to Berkeley in like 71 or something. And he told me that when they were introducing the first cal he was an engineer, right? So when they were introduced to like the first calculator or whatever it was. He was like, it was such a freaking huge event that the professor would take like three days to fill out an equation. And then this calculator would like freaking give you the answer in two seconds. And I was like, whoa, what the <laughs> hell happened? We're really in the space age. And now you don't even got to do any of that stuff. Yep. Right. So, I mean, why torture yourself more for no reason? There's no, yeah. Well, what's the point? Yeah. I think going back a little bit, it should be more of a test or being taught on like understanding 
yeah. how the stuff works or how to utilize yes. it. So if it's like yeah. a certain formula, it's not remember you know how the formula works or how to type it in because that's easy to look up. That takes five minutes. What's harder to look up is okay. How do I use this formula in a model? Or yeah, how, how do, do I, I implement this? it? Yeah, how do exactly. I implement yeah. that tool? Because right? if, if you understand, I think that probably takes longer, and that you could you know that's harder to figure out on your own or well, through Google than necessarily you know reminding yourself of oh uh, what do I you know how do I calculate yeah. IRR again? It's if I give you a screw and a hammer, you could get it into the piece of wood, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that's the way it's supposed to be used. Yeah, that's understanding the why behind it is important, right? It's like, yeah, I'm strong enough. I could smash this into the wood, but you, is that really what you're supposed to do? It's like, yeah. this is not the right tool. And that the implementation of stuff is more important. That might be the wisest thing you've ever said. I, I, I thought of that on the spot. I, as I was saying, I was like, yeah, motherfucker, that's right. <laughs> Trademark it. <laughs> I can give you a hammer and a screw, but it was good. I liked it. I did. I was very imp I impressed myself as I was saying it. This should be your <laughs> intro going forward. Yeah, <laughs> that's all it is. Um, awesome. I'm curious though. You said uh, your family owned some yeah. commercial real estate too. Was that you know from a young age? Was it as you were growing up? Well, well, no. My grandfather owned it, and then you know, like his kids owned more and more. You know, as you grow up, you you own a portion of investments, and a lot of stuff you hold on to it because it's in the right locations and stuff. Mm -hmm. Luckily for me, what happened is that a lot of the stuff that we did own, and it was retail, um, no houses, weirdly. Everybody talks about like owning houses before they do this. And I I have, would jump off a building and kill myself before I bought a house, <laughs> right? And uh, weirdly, I never did it because I think it's partly because nobody in my, I mean, they own their own houses and stuff, but not houses as investments, you know? Right. You know? So they did everything from like, you know, you buy land. Again, this is, you know, you've got money. It's like any doctor, physician, whatever. You know, you invest your money sort of deal. It isn't like that's what they did. So everything from retail to land, buying land to that sort of stuff over the years. But the one thing I did realize was because there were a couple of assets that we have. Now, it's, I think we're going to the fifth decade of holding it was that location matters so much that yep. literally you you can literally, all your sins are forgiven if you're in the right location. Yeah, literally. It's the real estate 101, right? Location. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I say to people all the time, you buy the right piece of dirt, you can fuck everything up. Time, you time heals all wounds. Up. Yeah. Do you, do you have a specific example in mind that you can share? Yeah, I can tell you in Pakistan at least, and we own some in Dubai and Canada as well. But specifically in Pakistan, we, again, just to tell you, because retail market, you'd be very surprised, is somewhat very similar across the world. Mm -hmm. Because whoever's retail and commercial real estate, because whoever's buying it typically happens to be somewhat sophisticated. They typically happen, at least if they don't have a complex financial model, at least they know how to run that. They run, know how to run the calculation because sure. they're in the market. This is what they do for a living. Dude, we've owned a couple of assets like going into the fifth decade. Straight up, the reason is high foot traffic and they're smack dab in the middle of the central business district. Literally, there have been times where we have literally done so many stupid things you have no idea. Like, I mean, <laughs> you, you, you go down the list of stupid things and we don't know. And we still survive. And the straight up, the reason was, look, if you got like 50, 80, 100,000 people and cars going by you, I mean, how do you screw that up, man? Yeah, it's, it's, pretty... it's kind of hard to screw that up. For sure. And same thing with hotels. Same thing with most commercial real estate, right? You got your multifamilies. If you're in a high foot traffic area, dude, jack up the rents. What are people going to do? Bitch and moan? Yeah, cool. Keep bitching and moaning and keep paying me my money. You know? It's 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 a fair point because you, you're not going to build a retail center where there's 13,000 people in the entire MSA, right? You know, yeah. if it's all farmland, you're not putting, you know, 17 big box retail stores. Think about yeah. all the big box retail stores, whether they're going out of business or not, they're doing um, like the demographic side of it. It's like, no, this side of the street gets way more people than this side. We're putting a Starbucks over here. Yeah. It's just, it's, you know, where there's people and traffic, like you said, if you don't want to pay for it, he will. And if he won't, one of the other 150,000 people. No, and that's the other thing. I think Chris and I have talked about this, right? Like I would much rather buy, again, this is purely a personal thing, obviously. This And this is not a money generation or return generation issue. This is a personal preference. I would much rather buy a B type property and slightly overpay for it. Because what I'm always looking at as an example is in case shit hits the fan, because you know I'm always paranoid about shit hits the fan, right? In case shit hits the fan, especially in these bigger markets where I'm in, right? I know for a fact, that tomorrow, if I want to go liquidate this, there is a deep buyer and seller pool for that same type mm -hmm. of product and asset that, look, I might find a better deal in the middle of nowhere, Mississippi. It might be the world's greatest deal. But if I ever go sell it, who the hell is going to buy it from me? Yeah. No, I mean, there's like two guys who are going to buy it from me and they already know why I'm trying to sell it. Yeah. And then they can hold 
hold me, you know, they can really, really screw around with me. But when I got five people and a line outside the door, we're like, look, man, take it or leave it. I got a line outside the door. They don't like it. Cool. Who gives a shit? I know that's the best position in the world to be in. And I, I, I agree. People don't, it's like you said, it's a personal preference thing, but you know, give me a really solid B plus B product in a great location. I'll overpay for it. I will personally, because I know one, I'm going to go to bed at night. And yeah, two, if, 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 shit, thing, right? yeah. if shit hits the fan, you know, yeah, okay, maybe it's not going to be a 45 IRR, but you know what? 12 is great. 15, I can go to bed. I can go to bed at night and know that in due time, I, I'm okay. And, 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 that's, and from a risk management point of view, right? If you think about it, look, the, look, if you manage the downside, look, if you're always in the game, like you were never wiped out, you always stayed in the game, invariably that means you become rich over a period of time. That's just compound returns. It's just, there's, there's, that's math. You can't argue against math, right? But if you go high, higher and higher up on the risk spectrum to the point where you might get wiped out, one little mistake wipes you out. Well, dude, the whole point of the game is to stay in the game. As long as you're <laughs> in the game for a prolonged period of time, you'll make the money. You'll make it up. For, like some years will be down, some years will be high, but you won't be poor, right? Yeah. You won't be bankrupt. I mean, it's kind of hard to screw up real estate if you buy in the right area. Correct. I mean, there and so many doctors in the world are testament to that. They all think they're God's gift to work. They all screw it up. <laughs> but the five percent of them who buy in the right areas, they screw up everything, and they're still coming out fine. Yeah, because you've got you know if sh you know shit hits the fan, your person that lives in the A class stuff, you know, is probably pretty comfortable moving down into the B class stuff if they have to or find. Yeah, but they're the they, but stuff. yeah, but they're not going to move to C class. They would much exactly. rather that's, sell the house and the car, but never move to C class for sure. And that's you know, that's the point. It's, you're always going to have, you know, an ask for that seat. You know, like I think yeah. about myself, I live in Williamsburg, which, you know, is probably an A-class area. Hipster would, capital of the world. There man. you go, man. Um, it's actually less hipster now than you would think. You really? You go yeah. outside Williamsburg. Yeah, now, now it's like professionals. Yeah, now it's <laughs> like if you're, if you're, you're not hipster if you're in Williamsburg anymore. Now you're too, really? you're too mainstream. Now, yeah, you're, you're, you're main, you're, yeah, I was gonna say, you're like, you're like, you may, you know, you're not a Brooklyn person anymore. Yeah, you're exactly. like a city person. Yeah. <laughs> It's certain, oh. like I lived in uh, I lived in Bushwick before that, Hipster. and that's that's, that's where you find hipsters. hipsters. But even Bushwick was starting to get to the point where it was like, oh, even now, like if you're all, if you want to be like the hipster, you couldn't live in Bushwick. It was but it was it was even a little bit too mainstream. When I when I was when I worked <laughs> for Marcus like, and Milchap, you got to go all the way out now. When I worked for Marcus and Milchap, and I was selling buildings in in Ridgewood and Bushwick, and this was 2012, 13, whatever, 14, 15, you know, two, in that range. Um, I remember I had. It was like when hipster, like the word like came out, right? It was early on. And I, I remember a kid say, like, he looked at it like it was a bad word. Like, I I'm not a hipster. Like, I'm better than them. They're like poor peasant people way out in Ridgewood. I'm like, what? Like, this, like, that's what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> but, but you do still get it, but it's, it's definitely more mainstream. But I, you know, if shit hit the fan and my income got slashed, I would move to, another part of Brooklyn that's not as nice. I would go move to a Bushwick or a downtown Brooklyn or what's underneath the Park Slope-ish. Park Slope's really nice, but yeah, there are parts. I'm trying to think what would be a good example. I guess Bushwick, Bed-Stuy. Yeah, parts. Yes, but would you commit to the unthinkable and move to New Jersey? Uh, forget that. Never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so that's that's why all of Jersey's C-class. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'll you in, and hopefully, oh, we're gonna have some angry letters, some angry yeah, texts. The, text the entire some... Jersey area just rips <laughs> us. You better watch out, man. I live pretty far away, but you might have some guys just whacking you over the head with a golf club, <laughs> golf club yeah. or something, man. Um, but yeah, but that's the point. It's if you know, you know, B class. You've got a lot of that stuff, and the really nice thing that I like about B class right now is because there's so many people chasing returns. They're yeah. forcing B class into like. A class. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. people are trying to argue that, oh, but there's people making C into B class. I don't buy that. There's not a lot of C that you can turn into a B class. Real, yeah, you can't even, no, but you can't B. even add any amenities, right? With the C class, the problem is you can't, it's the amenity issue that comes into play, yes. right? I feel like it just looks like C. That's the problem. I, you can't change the structure. That's the problem, right? Yeah. I think part of it is like, a lot of the B stuff is 80s or later, right? So yeah. part of it, I think a big part of it is nine foot ceilings is like yeah. a lot of them have that. You can't, if you got an eight foot ceiling, you got an eight foot ceiling. Not saying that B class has to be nine foot, but a lot of them are. Then it's like you said, the amenity package. And it's also just the location driven too. Like yeah. I can take a interior from a C interior to 
the nicest interior there ever is. But if my median income is $35,000, oh, it's a C-class area. Right. Like it is what it is. You're not going to be able to change everything. No, to, it's location. Really? It's location so, driven. I don't even. I don't even care about. I don't even care about apartment uh, ceiling heights. That it's. Location. Does it have amenities and does it have a location that warrants a rent of whatever B class rent is in your market? Because, you, you know, you can't take a mansard roof, seventies vintage shithole in the middle of a shithole location. Yeah. And you, you could you could anyone could spend ten thousand a door on the interior, right? We could put granite. We could put you know, LVP floor. We could do all of that. But as you said, if your location is on the other side of the tracks and it's thirty thousand medium income and the homes are worth sixty five grand, that is a that's never a B class property yeah. unless you know right here is you know downtown CBD district and then all you know right over here is another super urban trendy area and the path of progress is moving that way and all these places are going to be wiped out. Yeah, but, but you better be really sure it's happening. No, but the, yeah, but you can't do that in, in you know yeah, you can't do that yeah. in Mississippi. That you know that that's yeah. a very 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 you know tier one market play. Yeah, yeah. No, that is a primary market. Yeah, urban that, yeah. market. You, know, you don't do you, yeah you don't you don't do that in you know Canton, Ohio. It's just <laughs> that shit's not going to work. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um. So what? What you know, you obviously had the um, the stuff in Texas that you restructured. Yeah. At what point were you like, okay, I'm gonna you know start doing this on my own? And how did you start? Well, what happened is I did a one or two deals with uh, I was a really smaller player in this with your buddy Reed, right? You know, mm -hmm. Reed, right? yeah, yeah, alone. So I did that. But the other thing there was for me because I had luckily for me the thing is that I had ported over or brought along a lot of my relationships from my college days and all of that over a period of time. So a lot of those guys, what they really wanted to see was that I had started off, you understand? Because mentally, they just did not want to be the first person in the first ever deal, right? So when I got that start, what happened is in the meantime, because I'm, you know, I'm, I always stay in touch with people, like that got me started. I mean, I knew how to structure and run and manage all those deals anyways, like from a technical, financial, structural, and KPI-driven perspective, right? All of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But when that got started, I did one deal by myself pretty much. Then I did a couple of deals with partners. But again, the whole deal was that what I tell people is, as an example, I could have, I could be like five times as intelligent and I have access to 10 times as many people. But honestly, even if I was doing this in Canada, this would not have worked. It's straight up. This is pure market driven. And by market driven, I mean straight up purely driven by the fact that at this scale, at this pace, with this much investment, you can only do it in America, unless you're the luckiest guy in the world and, you know, you did it in England or France or whatever the hell, right? I am telling you, I've lived in a few countries. There is nowhere else on the planet right now. I'm willing to take a bet that you can go in, be like four years into moving into a country and be doing like $25, $30 million deals without necessarily having like, I don't know, $100 million balance sheet. Okay. So there is no other country in the world you can do this. Why do you think, that, what is it? Dude, I'm you telling you, is? like, there is, again, I'm an immigrant, so I could tell you this, that I think America is made of two people. People who are actually hustlers and the rest of the people who want to be hustlers. Right? <laughs> I'm just being honest with you, right? So, and I think there's, and I still don't know exactly what it is because if you think about it, Canada as an example or the UK, because I've got lots of friends here. It isn't that different because they speak the same language. We all kind of watch the same shows. You understand? So it, culturally, there are differences. Like culturally, there are differences in the US, but there isn't one thing you can point and say, oh, Canada is so much more different in that regard versus this on big picture items, right? Mm -hmm. There's just something. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the size of the country. Maybe it's the fact that there's lots of people here. There's a good amount of population. But people in the U.S., what I realized, are more receptive to investing and entrepreneurialism as versus a lot of other countries I've lived in. I, again, I don't know what the reason well, behind it is, but it's just the way it is. It's interesting. Well, that and I'm I don't want to you know be too incorrect here, but that's why people come to this country because I think that well here fuck that Americans suck and immigrants are better because they come here with that actual fucking work ethic. So like you said, there's hustlers and want to be hustlers. Immigrants come to this country and they work their ass off. Americans sit here and get lazy and don't do shit. That's why that opportunity is there. It's because our own people in our own country are fucking lazy. Yeah. And there's a lot of us. There's a lot of people, but but you know, immigrants come here with, you know, maybe it's the cultural differences in the other area where they come here and they're, you know, th there is it opportunity. It can be though, because I can tell you, I'm an immigrant. It, it's not just a cultural difference issue because if it was a cultural difference issue, you could just stay in your own country and do the exact same damn thing. 
You know, I, I, right? I you personally could work think harder in your own country, and I'm telling you, you're not going to make that much progress. No, no, I, yeah, I, I, I just up. think that the, 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 this is pretty fucking shitty to say, but I think Americans <laughs> really, truly are so lazy. They don't. They, they all want to. They want to. They want to have a Lamborghini. They want a big house. They want you know the pools and the cars and the jets, but they do not want to even think of the work that goes into that. When other people come from other areas and they're like, you know what, I'll sweep the floor. I will do this. And then while I'm doing that, I'm learning more. I'm educating myself more. Then I'm going to go out and, you know, buy a multifamily building, buy a retail center, whatever it is. Whatever. I think people yeah. are, are they work harder. When they come here, they come here for an opportunity, whatever that is, and they work harder than we do as ourselves. I, I, I mean, you see it. I mean, it's, it's, it's like this, it's like... There's so many examples of the guy that comes here with nothing and then he builds a, you know, a ridiculous company and he's- Dude, I mean, you've seen it across the board. Turn of the century, you have lots of Jews coming in, very successful community. You've got lots of Italians coming in, very successful. Lots of Irish people. Like, if you ask people 150 years ago, would Irish people be successful? People would freaking laugh at you. And now 14% of like people in government and really high positions are Irish. I, I read that a few days ago, right? So you have wave after wave of particular immigrant groups coming and man, I'm telling you this, man. Let's put it this way. If you cannot find a good... Look, so some social issues aside, like I can understand there are certain times yeah. when work is just bad. What are you going to do about it? But for the average person, if you cannot find a job in the US, let's put it, a job, a reasonable job. Nobody's saying it's got to be the best. Okay? Honestly, I'm telling you this, man. You are going to be in a world of hurt if you go to any other country. On yes. The Yes. You are not only going to world of hurt, not only are you going to be in a world of hurt, people are going to rub it in your face that you are freaking dumbass. Yes, exactly. That, right. That's like nobody, you, you can do it here. You can, you, if you apply yourself this much, that's why, they, that's why it is, you know, th there's so much opportunity in this country because if you apply yourself this much, it's amazing what you could accomplish. But if you apply yourself this much in other parts of the world, you're that's worthless. Lovely. It's just never going to happen. You, you're not that's even able to get out of bed in the morning. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And the other thing also, which I've really found out is, I, I love this about Americans, is like when most of my investors and continued investors, right? Not just the original ones, right? People who have come along over the years, they have been straight up because of referrals. People are very open to giving referrals in the US. People have no problem telling their friend, hey, I worked with this guy, he's really good, you should talk. People have no problem doing that. That's not always the case in other countries and other areas. Yeah, now, I, I don't know people. what it is, but I have had so many people say, hey, hey, man, you're doing a really good job, you know, because you have to do a good job, obviously, right? I really want you to meet this, this, this guy. And it turns out that guy gives me like half a million dollars. Yeah, that, that I, I can't speak to other areas, but I do know here... When, when you perform, people like to brag about their performing asset, whether it's an individual. It's oh like, God. oh, people hey, I want to introduce my friend. Her. Everybody yeah, wants that guy. Up. Yeah. it's yeah. It sounds strange to me that it wouldn't be that way anyway. I don't know. Because it just makes, I'm you, man. I'm it just makes you. logical sense to me that if you, somebody is looking for, you know, you're talking to a buddy and something comes up and you're like, oh, you're doing that. And you're like, yeah. And if they express and just say, hey, talk to you know the guy I'm using. It's a warm, you know, it's like a warm lead basically for whether it's, you know, a service or a product or whatever. It just, I don't know. Obviously, I'm only from here, so I don't see. But I have a but. pet theory on that. And I think the theory, my, at least my pet theory, at least the one that I'm going with these days is that I think, look, naturally, America is a country of immigrants to a certain degree, right? Mm -hmm. And every generation of people, persons, whatever groups you want to call it, they have come, they've hustled. So there is that concept of just coming and hustling, at least in the popular culture, there is a concept yeah. of hustling, right? It's not, it's not, for instance, considered low class to hustle. Let's put it this way. In a lot of countries, it is considered very low class to hustle, or at least interesting. Do it yeah, that, now, that conceptually yeah. makes sense. From my knowledge of, you know, certain yeah. people and, and just having a couple friends that, that, that concept, and like you said, you're buying into it. I can yeah. totally get behind that because some people look at hustling as like it's a you know oh that guy's a you know like a panhandler. It's like it's it's yeah. not looked at as you know oh, wow that's really cool that guy's making it happen. But I do think that in this country, I know for a fact that people like envy that wow you know that guy really make it happen. He's getting out of bed. He's hustling. He's he's making it happen. I mean we have it all the time. Like some of our older investors, like I love that you guys are young and you hustle, right? Like it happens all oh, the time. That's the other thing I've had a lot of times. I think you had been there. I've had so many people tell me I I, I, I thought that wouldn't happen or I thought that's kind of weird. So many people have told me you know what man I like you, you hustle but the other deal also is you're young and 
I want to back a young man. Again. Yes, that that is a big that one too. That is so common. You have no idea, and that's yeah. not the case in most other countries. It's like you gotta have, you gotta be fifty before people take you seriously. Yeah, I think it's. I've had that a little bit, but I've definitely, maybe not directly in words, but I've definitely gotten that sense from a lot of people where it's like, oh, you're how old? You're twenty eight. That's amazing. Like you know, like let's let's sit down, let's have a conversation. It's you know, because I think a lot of it is like you said, you know, everybody starts at some point and the people that have money that are looking to invest passively have probably done the same thing, gotten through it and had success. And they're like, OK, this is, you know, like, a, you know, cut from the same cloth type thing. Exactly. You know, this is a way I can invest in something I, I like as well as, you know, give back or support something that I am a fan of or I am a product of. Yeah. It makes a ton of sense. I think that we get that. Like, I know some of our older investors and some of my guys that I you know, I know for a fact they're guys. Like, you know, we have you know Larry Silverman owns a ton of buildings. You know, why would he invest with us? He owns. He does it in New York and New Jersey, but he loved what we were doing when I was twenty four. And you know, seven years later, six years, eight years later, he's still investing because he loves the fact that I brought him an opportunity at twenty five years old, whatever it was. And he's like, wow, this is my way. He's 60, probably, give or take. It's like, oh, look, he's doing what I did, and it's giving me more diversification to something that I would never have access to. Mm -hmm. And I think they like that. I, I do think they like that. I think they like that that aspect of it. Yeah, I think it makes sense. And I think it's interesting to hear that because I know, you know, when I first started three years, three and a half, four years ago, whatever it is now, it was like, how am I supposed to contribute to money raising? Like I'm a 24 year old kid. Like I don't know Dick. And I think it's one, you get to a certain stage and it's, you have enough to be dirty and you're never going to know a whole lot more until you've done it for 30 years. You know, there's a, there's an upswing and then there's a slow growth over the next 30 years. And it's like, at that point, it's okay. You know, you just, you, know, you got to know enough to be able to be comfortable and go out and do it. Mm -hmm. Not too much else, especially when, you know, you have the resources of, you know, you and Don as well kind of backing me up at the time. But it was the, you know, the thought process of like, why would somebody do it? And I think it makes a ton of sense that, you know, the way you guys are phrasing it and putting it together. Um, yeah, but it's only in the US, I can tell you that. It's interesting. Only in the US, maybe. We've we've actually had recently a lot of people from out of the country it, signing it, up as leads on our website. It's, it's, it's been unreal. It's been interesting. Like we, yeah, but the other deal also is the the amount of yield you can get in the U.S. You're not getting. Well, that, that's what I say. I think that has to do with the yields that the U.S. Yeah. gives. Like I know, I know Reed, very good friend. He has yeah. a bunch of people from you know o Australia and other areas that invest. And I do think you know he's. I don't want to say he shift his product class, and I don't want to speak for him, but I know they're buying much nicer, newer stuff because yeah. I think the yields and the risks are far better here than where they oh, may be deploying their money. So yeah. I think that's another reason for it because, you know, you can get, I mean, Canada, you can't buy shit. I mean, it's, you know. Dude, it, you got to sell a portion of your soul to be able to afford a parking lot. Yeah. It's even like this, the, you know, our, we have a group of uh, Israeli investors. Uh, their cap rates in Tel Aviv are like lower than Manhattan. Yeah. It just, it just, it's very unaffordable. Dude, in Toronto, like if you go to Toronto to buy something, your cap rate is like 3%. Or I was about to say, it's like, it's, yeah, it's like two, 3%. Yeah. I know that because yeah. I, I had a friend who was, you know, I remember he sent me a deal in like Cleveland. He's like, look at this thing. It's like a five cap. I'm like, don't buy that. He, but, <laughs> but he was from, he was from Toronto, but he's like, no, it's right. Oh, you know, it's so close. I'm like, yeah, but don't buy that deal. But he loved it because 5%, I could buy that cash. It's like three times my return at home. I'm like, that doesn't mean it's a good deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's also interesting too because, and Omar, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of other countries don't have nearly the same scale of large multifamily. Yeah, it's not just the, the scale. Does. It's also the, the – straight up, it's a scale issue. You're 100% right. The other issue also is the maturity of the market because, for instance, you can go – you can get a loan. First of all, no. You can't get non-recourse loans anywhere in the world. Are you freaking kidding me? Non-recourse? When I moved to the US and somebody told me you can get non-recourse loans, I actually choked on my food. I was like, are you kidding me? This is, this is asking to abuse the system. This is going out of your way to tell people to commit fraud. This is asking to commit fraud, right? This is literally putting a billboard on your building saying, please take all our money and run away. Right? <laughs> literally. But apparently I was wrong because... Look, that's part of the way business happens. But so the market is so mature on the lending side as well. Look, you guys go to get homes. It's like these lenders fight like cats and dogs. And the difference is like two basis points. Yeah. <laughs> right. But I mean, look, 
I mean, you guys fight like cats and dogs to get the deal. So I'm not saying you guys aren't fighting, but the market is so mature. The biggest deal is non-recourse loans. Holy shit. You got to be kidding me, man. Plus the terms you get on the loans, right? Man, we closed a deal in Atlanta two months ago or one and a half months ago or whatever. It's a bridge loan. And my interest rate is 4.5%. So, so that's, it's funny. Are you kidding we're, me? That we're, we're closing a deal next week and our loan on a bridge loan is four point, I think it's 4.43 today. Yeah, because LIBOR <laughs> went down by 10. And I was yeah. kicking myself the other day because LIBOR went down by 10 days. I was like, oh, you got to be freaking kidding me. <laughs> but these are nice problems to have is what I'm trying to say. Exactly. Dude, it's you great. You cannot get a 4.5% loan this big with so many easy things. You know, you can get out whenever the hell you want. You get a rehab dollars, blah, blah. Best of luck trying to get it. Unless, I don't know, you know the prime minister of the country and you live in a third world country and it's a banana yeah. Short of that, you're not getting these loans. I don't, I don't care how big you are; it's not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. No, I think all that's really interesting because we definitely, we definitely live in a bubble. Whether it's the country or even just you know the U.S. real estate investing market slash world, and it's like, you know, that bubble is you know the country is what 330 million, and the real you know real estate investing is. You know, maybe a couple million people. Like, yeah, but 330 million people who are rich relative to the world. Not 330 but, but million. But what I'm saying is, is yeah. you know, we we look at the world as, you know, our bubble and we don't think about how the other, you know, 7.3 billion people view the world. And if, you know, the rest of the world is two caps and you can buy five caps in the U.S., that's amazing. Hence, hence why we're selling deals for four caps in yeah. Florida. <laughs> but like, you don't think about it. You just see, you know, rates have come down, you know, cap rates have come down from call it six to five, right? Just for argument's sake and, you know, top 50 MSAs. And you're like, oh my God, like how much lower can it go? But you go out, you know, you go right over the border and, yeah. you know, you're buying stuff in Toronto for three caps. And it's like, you know, sometimes because we live in that bubble, it's tough to put things in perspective of the world. And that's why you have so much foreign money coming over, buying stuff for ridiculous low prices because it's better than where they would get it back home. Same for us, yeah. right? That's why we're buying in Florida. Yeah. It's not why we're buying in New York. Correct. It's just we, a little I mean, bit I, shorter distance from here to Florida than China to, you know, the Carolinas. Yeah. So I think it's really interesting. Um, what what are you guys doing going forward? How you know, how are you guys looking at the market, looking at deals, investing, stuff like that? Look, I can tell you this, all this hype about a recession. Again, I don't have a crystal ball. Of course. All this hype about people telling me about a recession. I just think Americans are morbidly obsessed with the end of days. <laughs> like, like they're morbidly it's definitely obsessed true. It's so that true. Uh, the day of reckoning is coming and we're all gonna die. I don't know why y'all are so freaking obsessed about it. I have no idea, but y'all are so freaking obsessed about it. It's kind of funny. It's trust me, guys. If the day of reckoning comes, it's going to come to the U.S. the last. Okay? <laughs> You're going to have lots of time to prepare. Okay, lots of time to repent for your sins. Now that doesn't mean you do dumb shit. All I'm trying to say is, look, if you're buying a decent deal, there's a hundred dollar, whatever, seventy five hundred dollar rent upside, and your interest rate is four point four three percent. Jesus Christ, what else do you want, man? Like seriously, what the hell else do you want? Do you want somebody to just come to your house in the middle of the night and give you a pot of gold? Like that—that's that is literally the next step. <laughs> I also think I think in that in the regards, I think the last recession was so bad. Yeah, yeah, it's just in people's heads. No, now now no, nobody wants two. to put their neck out. What's the last? Nobody two? wants now. Everybody will. I told you so. I told you so. It's like you've been telling me so for four years, right? Like it's at some point, it's a boy who cried wolf. Yeah, but. Yeah. But at the same time, I do believe that you are right. I think just inevitably, you know, we're all, whoa, we're so, uh, this is so bad. We, you know, everybody likes to complain. Yeah. Um, there but, was there was some video. And look, on, think about, no, hold on, one more thing though, by yeah, the way. Yeah. yeah, we all bitch and moan, but it's all the freaking tax benefits you get. Are you kidding me? Yeah. The, the tax, I can tell you this because I've got lots of Canadian investors and a couple of British and UE investors. The tax benefits that you get in the US, as it relates for this cost segregation, can't do it in Canada. Can't even come close. Yeah, there you go. Nothing like reason. accelerated depreciation exists. So I literally have investors who look at their K1 and tell me, dude, honestly, if you didn't even pay me cash and I just took their depreciation losses and in the end you just gave me the equity return, I would still be coming out net net ahead of everything. See, like that's the stuff that So we gotta start raising money from the yeah, UK pe people and don't I don't think people do a good enough job at exp at really pounding home the benefits. I got on a call yesterday with a lady who at one point told me your tax consequence was like 15 grand on the capital gains. And I'm like, that's what do you, what do you care? 
Then lo and behold, it's like 80 grand. And I'm like, listen, you don't understand the benefit of investing in this property. You're going to net wash out. It's going to go away. You're going to, you're going to show losses for years. Yep. And we'll figure it out in ten, five years from now. But she, she just couldn't get over the fact. Uh, she couldn't get over it. I was like, do you not understand this? Like you're going to pick up so much, so many benefits. You're going to get a $10,000 check and show a $30,000 loss on your K-1. I can tell you this, you you can do it the same way, at least in Canada and the US. You can you cannot do it the same way. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. I think that's that's really interesting. I didn't realize that see, that's what I'm saying. Like a lot of the stuff that I think people take it for granted, right? If you're in if you're a US investor, you're probably only investing in US real estate. Not gonna go outside the country. So you don't know any better. Same thing where we were talking about, you know, you know, hustle and stuff. I think the US has that culture, so that's why it's so, you know, admired or, you know, people look at it positively because we don't know any better. It's just what people do and successful people do. So yeah. it's the same thing. So it's like if you don't have exposure to what, you know, Canadian investing is like. And it's, you know, now you hear about a little bit through podcasts and stuff like in the internet, but you yeah. don't experience it. No. It's not like you've, you know, if you're a 50 year old, you know, man or woman, and you've been investing in Canadian real estate for the last 30 years. That's all you've known. And then now all of a sudden you invest in the U.S. stuff and you get $10,000 and a $30,000 loss. You're like, holy shit, I struck gold. Yeah. So it's like, I think it's just all a matter of perspective where it's like, if you've only been in US, investing in U.S. real estate for the last five, 10 years, you expect the depreciation, you expect the losses. And it's like, now it's like, okay, and your deal. And so then when people come to you and say, well, your deal only makes 12%, or 10% or 5%, it's you have the expectation of all that basic stuff already. You don't have the, I guess, the background exposure to, you know, the other side of the coin that the rest of the world experiences. Hey, and just to let you know, when people tell me like 13, 14%, what I tell people is, you know, Ray Dalio, like one of the greatest hedge fund investors of all time. Yeah, his all time track record, average annual returns are 14%. Okay. So shut the fuck up, okay? Fifteen to sixteen percent IRR on something with tax benefits. This guy is net, but you still once he gives you the money, you still have to pay income tax on it and capital gains tax on it, right? So give me a freaking break, man! If you can net fifteen percent and you're bitching about it, give me a freaking break. That, that, I want that to be the clip. It's like fourteen percent. Fuck you. <laughs> no, it's I true. Mean, literally, it's... Ray Dalio, one of the geniuses of all time. It's, He's netting 14%. What the hell are you complaining it's about? It's mind blowing to me when you present a 14, 15, and, and they look at you like you fucking shot somebody. They're like, oh. Yeah. Uh, you know, this guy's sending me 30s. I'm like, he's a fucking moron. That's, that's, it's just, oh, I, you, you I, don't understand. I've, I've had an investor who tell me, I only invest in deals that are 20% IRR plus. I was like, dude, give me one second. I will change the exit cap rate. Get back to you. No <laughs> it's just like, yeah, hold on. I'll change 30%, I'll call, baby. No worries. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll call you back in two minutes. Give me one second. Yeah. Check your email. But it's yeah. so true. It's, you know, it's, you want me to put bullshit on paper, I'll put bush, bullshit on paper, but just think about it conceptually. Like you said, you imagine make 14% a year. If your average return is 14% a year and you, you know, in 10 years, 14 compounded, you know, whatever, you know what I'm saying, but you're going to have an astronomical amount of money. You're not going to yeah. know what to do with it with tax benefits. And most and, of it is tax benefits. So like, yeah, and tax it. benefits. Yeah. So what are you complaining about? Yeah. It's like, just go, come on, let's go to bed at night. Let's not, let's not try and reinvent the wheel and turn a crack den into, you know, you know, fucking the, whatever, the Sistine's Chapel. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I was arguing, we were arguing yesterday, the day before, there's a deal in Florida. It's a loan assumption. So your leverage is like, mid to high 60s and it's still like a 12 13 14% return in like 7 years. Cash flow is like 8 9% and we're fighting back and forth whether we think we can raise the 10 million dollars or not for it because risk adjusted it's a phenomenal deal. Your downside is so well protected. It's an 80s built deal. It's in a phenomenal location, but it's like we're like ah oh, are people going to see a 12% or a 13% and go, ah, you know what? I'll just wait for the next one or I'll, I'll go invest in something else. Cause it's on paper, it's probably one of our better. Absolutely. If you, if you could come up with a metric that took your return and discounted it based on the risk, if there was some magical formula that, that did that. Maybe there is, and I just don't know about it. And there I'm, is. You, and just I'm have the to cre- you just have to create your own discount rate. Yeah. I, but then, but then it's, <laughs> you know, you can't compare from one to the other. So it's yeah. like, uh, tr- trust me, I've tried that rabbit hole. It's never going to work. But anyway, if you could somehow, you know, the same, my 18 is the same as your 18, right? Percent return in theory. 
if I, if I give you, you know, if you invest a hundred and I give you 18%, whether it's with you or whether it's with me, you made 18% return. If you could somehow create a formula that said, well, it's an 18 after, you know, a risk, yeah. Yeah. this would probably be our first or second best risk adjusted return deal. Assuming we, you know, get it for what we want it for. So that's be, not going to happen. Yeah, that's not going <laughs> to happen. Not but happen. Be that as it may. But it's like, how do you convey that to people who, you know, are looking at 18s and are looking at 20s and I'll drop the cap rate to five. It's never going to sell for a five cap in seven years, but oh, no, but put I a realize, 20 on man, paper. You, you can't argue with that, man. You can't argue with idiots, man. I mean, it's, because eventually what happens, it's like that great saying I read once, you don't screw around with the pig because the pig likes getting dirty. <laughs> so, I like that. So what are you going to do about it? Man, trust me. I've had these conversations so many times. I was like, look, man, I can lie to you. And if you want, I'm not going to do that. But if that's what you want me to do, I'll sure, I'll say it, whatever you want me to do. It. But or I can tell you the truth and not sell a piece of my soul out. Well, we right? had, we had an one event. Other. We, had a, we had a group that literally said, I'd rather see a 20 on paper and be wrong than see a 15 and overperform. Yeah. Oh man, they, they must flat be out said that. They, they they must be the abusive girlfriend in every room. So you want me to just lie? To lie. You. you want me to show yeah. you 5% vacancy, no concessions, no bad debt, sell it at a five and a quarter cap, 70s vintage. You'd rather see that than me put a really nice 1985, 1995 deal in front of you that you can go to bed at night. Yes. Yeah, I, I have them. Honestly, I was like, okay, you you can't you can't argue with that kind of. No, logic. it's never going to work. No, it's yeah. it's tough, and I wish there was a way. I've been thinking about it a lot the last year because I had like my uncle basically come in and look at a deal, and he wanted to sit. He's like, print out the book. I want to sit down. I want to talk through it. Came in for five minutes. He said, "Flip to the returns page." I was like, "What the <laughs> fuck?" Are you oh doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody does that, and you, and all the spiel you give to people about risk. I'm like, why do I even? Done. Why do I even put together a sixty page book? I'm gonna put out a one. I'm gonna put out one page, and it's just gonna be a big sixteen percent IRR. You don't even need to know the name of the property. But but you know the funny thing, if you did that. They'd want the whole story. No, of course. Yeah, they want to start doing that. They, they'd be like, here's, a, here's our investor book. It's a big 16 on paper. It's just <laughs> no splits, no nothing, no information, just a 16 with a percentage point. That's it. Yeah. Next deal. We and, just all this, and, all spiel, and all the spiel you give people about, hey, we've got good benchmarks, we've got track record. Yeah, none of that shit matters. Yeah. No, it's yeah. like to, to, to flip to the back page, it's like, oh, 13 and no. But I wish Have you there- seen that movie like this? Sorry, sorry, Rob. Have you seen that movie, This is Final Cap? No. no. What is it? Okay, this is a this is a mockumentary. It was it's an older movie. It's really fun. There is a scene in the movie This Is Final Tap where you should literally Google uh, YouTube this. It's called This Goes to Eleven. Literally, it's one of the most monumental scenes in in film history. Okay, you should see that, and you will totally understand. What <laughs> Every time somebody tells me that, I literally send them that clip from YouTube. All there right, you go. we're gonna. That, I'm doing it once we get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> but I this wish there was like I wish there was something on the returns page. It was like this is an 18 percent return, and it's a 10% risk or something like that, where it was like some metric or some so, number so that I've you seen could point people, to. I've seen people try and put like stress testy type where they put like, it's like a big graph and it'll be like green and red. And it's like, this is like the the green area. This is where it gets red. It, it I've seen people play around with things. Yeah, everybody overlooks it. Though. Yeah, it's, it yeah, it's, it's like, that's what I'm saying. It, it'd be really cool if someone looked at it and understood it and said, wow, that makes a lot of sense. But people overlook those things. It's like, ah, oh, pretty graph, flip next page. They yeah. don't care. People well, don't care. So it's it's funny you say that because I used to think like 18, 24 months ago, I really thought that people like us would be out of a job in the next five to 10 years because I thought- Oh, bro. Tech, well, hear me Hell out because no. I thought technology <laughs> was going to eliminate middlemen. Now I've totally flipped the other way because people don't have the time or the wherewithal to be able to understand whether it's a good deal or a bad deal. So I think there's going to, I think there's actually going to be a bigger rise in more middlemen, like equity people that are going to sell investors on, Hey, you know, we already say, Hey, we look at a hundred deals. We only buy five a year. Now it's going to be, you know, we we raise money for operators' deals. They look at 100 deals, they only buy five. We look at 100 of their deals and we I mean, only like invest in 10. Yeah, so yeah. it's now you're getting a percentage of a percentage. I think there's actually going to be more of a rise, whether it's like a crowd street or a realty shares or an into, or if it's just, you know, uh, you know, like a good egg who we had on where they're just raising money because people aren't going to understand or want to spend the time to understand what makes a good deal, a good deal and a bad deal, a bad deal. I also think people just 
regardless of what people say, I did not used to believe this, uh, but I have a big believer, especially after I talked to my dad, he pounded this into me and I was like, dude, you're an old guy. You don't know fuck all. <laughs> Anyways, so I now personally believe that people actually like the concept of knowing that there's a human being at the other end who's listening to them. Honestly, they could be speaking complete gibberish. They just like the idea of human being. That's, 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 that's dumb. Yeah. He, he hates having, like, he, he wants to pick up the phone and speak to someone. And as do I, yeah. you know, what drives me crazy in today's world when young, and I'm, I'm only 32, but I'm not, I'm not 60, but can you do this? And it's like, no, hold on. I go to a website and I pull up a chat and I'm like typing. I'm like, pick up the motherfucking phone and call somebody. I hate the easy way out, which is no communication with humans. A lot of people do that. It's a little different than what you guys are saying. Like, but the, the, I do agree that there is going to go, it's going to go back the other way. It's so far to the, I don't have to speak to humans anymore that it, I do believe it'll swing back the other way when, when human interaction becomes a thing again. Yeah. I think it, it'll depend on like how complex the task is. Well, yeah. Right. Like true. our stuff yeah, is yeah. very it's not hard, but it's very complex. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of knowledge you need to have that, you know, the random person off the street doesn't have. But if it's, you know, buying a, you know, toilet paper, right? You just go on Amazon, you do it. You don't need a person yeah. for that. No, agreed. So I think it's I was really, joking you know, around the other night in you know, bed. I was ordering like, McDonald's. You yeah. don't need a person to oh. take your order for McDonald's. Well, I, I heard that most of the drive through windows at a lot, like a lot of places are actually like outsourced to other countries. It's not even a person. Oh yeah. No, location. this is really old. One really? of my, yeah. I, I, oh yeah, one of my family members, he's a, he's a Columbia graduate, but he's been in private equity since like the mid nineties and all. He, he's, he's run $2 billion companies as well. His pioneering thing was like, he's worth a couple hundred million dollars now. His pioneering thing was that, you know, in New York and LA where you click on an intercom and somebody, you know, whatever your attendant says, Hey, where do you want to go? Whatever. Like these are really high class buildings, right? And they always have an attendant on site. And so, yeah, on. yeah. His whole thing was he built call centers in Indian Pakistan where when you click that button, all, and these are ultra luxury apartment buildings. Yeah. I'm talking like really nice ones. If somebody, in Indian Pakistan, in real time, would be like, hey, sir, what's going on? And they obviously, they're trained on accents and all of that stuff, right? So it sounds like an American speaking it, right? And hey, sir, what's going on? How can I help you? How, what can I do for you? Do you want your shoes polished? Hell yeah, I'll, I'll polish your shoes. <laughs> Literally, that was his entire business. Yeah, no, he, I, I, I was listening to someone the other day talking about that most fast food places and stuff like when you drive your car up and you speak to the drive through it is no longer a person in the actual restaurant because it was it was a job that was way cheaper and it's almost plug and play. It's I want chicken McNuggets. Okay, that's a number six, right? It's easy to give that information, and and because of the internet and everything, it's so, it's so live action. By the time you drive up, yeah. they they it's on the computer. It's like, all right. I got to do a number six. I got a number eight, and pr that's why those menus are so generic. And they're be it, now some people. Oh, I don't want pickles. Yeah, they get that right. It's easy to put that in, but you're not. It's not like you're going out to dinner and you're ordering a beef Wellington, right? And I want it medium, medium. It's it's. It's very, very, very cut and dry. You can't order a medium rare burger at McDonald's. It's yeah. like, I want a Big Mac, right? Yeah. Done. No question. So I thought that was but really But what you can get is an ice cream at McDonald's. Never. That's true. <laughs> but although <laughs> I, I, now, now I did after I hear that I had to go to a McDonald's and I saw the headset and I was like, this guy's fucking lying. What I just heard is wrong, but who the hell knows? Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. I think that's a awesome place to wrap up. Yeah. Um, Omar, thank you so much for coming on. No, thank uh, you for having me. This was awesome. Me. I, I think you had it. a ton of interesting insights uh, and experiences and stuff that people are going to get a ton of value from. Um, if people want to learn more about you, uh, hear more of your stuff, um, get in contact with you, where can they do that? So they can go to, first of all, I thought you never asked this question. This is the most important question you've asked. Okay. <laughs> so they should go to Boardwalk Wealth, B-O-A-R-D, Walk Wealth, one word. Right on the front page, we've got this little, whatever, like three field thing. Hopefully you know your name, so type that down. You know your email, type that down. And where, where'd you hear about us? This podcast, right? And then trust me, I will be in touch with you. Don't worry about that. Perfect. Um, awesome. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, this was great. Hey, buddy. thank you for having me. Take it easy, guys. Thank Have you. A good one. Bye.